Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming over and listening to some interesting insights so far. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, leveraging the power of social and discovery commerce and how it is impacting our brands and our businesses and our planning. Uh, we have experts and veterans from the industry who are going to share their point of views on how they are leveraging social and uh, discovery commerce, how they are looking at this entire era which is shaping up very differently and impacting ROAS, ROIs, how brands are investing on, on these channels and platforms. So uh, I will first start off by opening up uh, this panel uh, you know, uh, asking each of the panelists to kind of share their thoughts on social and uh, discovery commerce, and then we'll move to pointed questions. So uh, I'll just pass the mic to Tanvi, and you know, you can share your thoughts, and we can pass the mic around. Uh, thanks, thanks. Am I audible? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the power of or the opportunity in social and discovery commerce especially coming from uh, you know a, a, a brand like uh, nivea with uh, you know where we are heavily entrenched into skin care i think the opportunity for us honestly is huge uh, we've seen uh, you know consumers uh, you know are pretty much online their entire journey of discovery of exploration is happening on the online space today so uh, we've largely scaled up, uh, you know, our digital efforts, our, you know, entire, uh, you know, full funnel efforts to kind of, uh, you know, close the loop uh, in terms of where the consumer is today. So I think in that sense, uh, it's, it's definitely a huge opportunity. Uh, I do think in India, it's, it's still at a very uh, fairly nascent stage. So um, one aspect of it being yesterday, consumers are extremely, uh, you know, comfortable with, uh, you know, transacting online. Are they still comfortable transacting online outside of a marketplace or outside of, uh, you know, a, a, a platform where they're habituated to shop? Maybe something that will grow, uh, you know, as we move along. But I think today, uh, uh, consumers are looking for, especially in the skincare category, again, coming to that. Uh, I think consumers are, uh, you know, heavily discovering there are a lot of D2C brands in, you know, in that play. People are, you know, coming across newer brands and, you know, uh, trying to, you know, find the right fit for them because it's, 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 uh, it's ultimately about them finding the relevant fit. So I think huge opportunity, but um, yeah, a lot of headroom to grow. Interesting, Tanvi, you know, thanks for sharing your views on how Nivea and the skincare category looks at it and how you're looking at, uh, you know, a very uh, B2C approach. I think Shorya will help us, uh, you know, throwing some light on how uh, he looks at uh, this entire space and how it impacts merchants and the B2B, uh, from a B2B perspective. Yeah, hi. Uh, so the, the business that I represent basically sells primarily to grocery merchants and uh, contrary to you know the majority belief that they are not on social media and they are not spending time on social media to uh, whether improve their business or uh, you know understand the nuances of what's happening uh, uh, you know with the social media audience that's not true uh, so what we've seen is that uh, whether it's our acquisition funnel uh, where we acquire merchants, that happening on uh, Facebook and Instagram, uh, then uh, the retention funnel where we talk about the new products that we are launching, the new promotions uh, that we are launching uh, again on social media platforms is very prevalent and they, you know, there is a positive affirmation from the merchant side that they are willing to look at it and actually also go back to the platform and, and, and make a purchase. Uh, and drawing from this insight, we have uh, within the product also, you know, created a video feed where merchants can understand, uh, you know, uh, what are the new products that we are launching. So someone down south might not be using the same, uh, you know, detergent powder as uh, people in the north. So uh, merchants can understand that, look at those categories and also understand our programs uh, better. Uh, so, you know, we've, you know, sort of seen the journey of sending a flyer to a merchant's shop to making it a static creative on social media to actually converting it into video. And uh, we see that, you know, going ahead that, that video will serve 
you know a big part in how they continue to shop with us and understand you know the val uh, the benefit of the platform thank you thank you for sharing your perspective uh, you know uh, interesting to hear a very different side on you know how merchants and the b2b category kind of is also very actively looking at developing and leveraging uh, discovery and social commerce uh, i'll now invite shakti to share his views uh, from a programmatic lens how do you see uh, you know the entire social and discovery commerce coming to life and how can brands uh, you know leverage uh, programmatic to their advantage Thanks, Ashan. So, uh, as consumers today, we are uh, spoiled with choice for every product that we want to choose, right? Uh, or we want to buy for that matter, uh, right from your uh, cosmetics, your uh, toothpaste for that matter as well. And as marketers, uh, we are further spoiled for choice because we have so many platforms, we have so many avenues, especially in the programmatic scope of things, uh, that can enable uh, this. Uh, Research uh, for any purchase has been an innate uh, uh, activity that people do, uh, right from uh, speaking to your peers uh, or uh, going and reading reviews for that matter. But uh, discovery commerce, I feel uh, from a media lens point of view, is one step before that, right? Uh, like we were talking outside that people are able to discover new products even on quick commerce for, uh, these days for that matter. That I would probably just uh, uh, key in cooking oil and I could be thrown a brand that I've not actually heard of before. I might use that brand name, go to Google, go to Amazon for that matter and uh, keep uh, researching for it and eventually make the purchase elsewhere uh, and not from the original platform that I had discovered this, right? So it becomes very important for us to understand the power that the audience that I'm targeting uh, that is available on the platforms that I'm going to use uh, use those platforms at scale and therefore ensure that before they are able to get into the awareness and consideration uh, cycle or funnel of uh, the customer journey, I'm able to introduce my product to them. So that I think is something that a uh, shift in our uh, purchase journey that is happening across and it is not limited to one sector, it is across retail, across fashion, across electronics, across auto for that matter, right? So that's, that's what I feel. Thanks, thanks Shakti for sharing your views. Uh, completely agree on, on this point you made on, you know, shift in the journey, right? Uh, as traditional marketers, uh, you know, the thinking across, uh, you know, brands and clients and marketers is, how do I sharp target the audience? How do I kind of you know, ensure that my communication reaches out to a very specific audience or a demographic or a psychographic, right? Uh, what social uh, and discovery commerce is actually enabling is to kind of widen that, right? Uh, which essentially goes back to the good old days and, you know, uh, uh, reminds me of the popular campaign that Amazon ran on Or Dikhao, right? Where in the good old days, you would, you would go to a shop and say Or Dikhao, Or Dikhao, right? Are brands actively investing on the or the cow approach on, on commerce now, right? That's what discovery commerce is all about, right, uh, to a large extent. And uh, yeah, I will now invite uh, Puneet to share his views on, on uh, how, how you are looking at leveraging, uh, you know, social and discovery commerce. Sure. So I have uh, three points to make, right? So uh, uh, India today is uh, 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 the, the youngest Gen Z population, has got the youngest Gen Z population and the younger millennials there. Uh, the entire population, the cohort, uh, which is the Gen Zs and the younger millennials are mobile first, right? And there is uh, research today to prove that, uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but there is significant amount of time spent by uh, majority of the population in this country on online window shopping. Right, you actually uh, discover a lot of products across categories that you want to buy, you spend time, and there is almost like uh, a, a place where people would want to spend time uh, on, on the screens to just see what I can buy, what, is, what are the options available, and so on and so forth. Now for us, uh, we are uh, fortunate to be uh, in the right of the center of, uh, or uh, in the middle of the last mile between the consumers and the whole host of categories and industries. 
Now, what we also do is uh, uh, the point across all the panelists and what you also spoke is uh, is relevance, right? Uh, it, it only uh, the transaction or the engagement only happens if there is relevancy in the messaging or what you see between the brand and uh, the consumer. Now, for that to happen, and hence you need to make sure that the inciting done at the back end is uh, is is very thorough. So what we do is we we use a lot of these machine learning tools like uh, like you know like a decision tree which basically helps you to cohort uh, to bifurcate consumers into different cohorts. Then you use uh, credit modeling to understand uh, uh, within those cohorts whether if that particular uh, uh, you know percentage of or community within the cohort has uh, the wherewithal or the uh, you know the uh, can afford a particular product or not. We use predictive analysis to understand uh, which is the next category this cohort is most likely to buy in the next 12 month uh, cycle. Uh, and, uh, and obviously there is user behavior today which is, which is available to almost everyone uh, to understand where, where, where do you actually engage with this cohort in the entire consumer journey. So you know putting all these things together I think yes this is uh, the way to go and how brands use uh, machine learning. Uh, algorithms uh, and consumer inciting to you know to uh, to bring to bring the brand closer to the consumer is the way I look at it. Interesting, you talk about you know um, the consumer journey and uh, you know how you are kind of leveraging data and creating cohorts to targeting uh, these cohorts. Um, the next question that comes to my mind is uh, you know uh, what about the investments uh, you know on asset development. Is that, is that something that you actively, you know, work on, build on, uh, you know, has that journey changed for you in terms of the kind of assets and the type of assets that you're, you know, developing and, uh, you know, how, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'll just continue to the earlier topic which I just spoke about. So, you know, building assets today is uh, primarily to figure out a customized model which works for your business, your category and your consumers, right? Now, uh, I, and that has been a p p paradigm shift in the way you approach the, on the specific models. Now, typically and traditionally what you had is you had a media model, you had a, a engagement model which had, it was a cookie cut, cut approach, right? But as we speak today, uh, even within your uh, business there will be sub-categories, sub-segments, and how do you customize and build a model which is an asset for yourself which can be you know uh, 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 you know trademarked later on but that is where i think uh, today uh, 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 is where 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 the you know the punt is and the other point which i want to make is uh, building asset today uh, is not uh, a prerogative of or, or a privilege of a bigger brand i mean every small brand smes or uh, startups can build their own assets right so, because the data and because the tool is so freely available for everyone else, so yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, you know, again, building on that thought, the good old days was all about the 30 second TVC and you know, a large creative or a single campaign uh, that worked on a singular thought, which then kind of moved to digital first assets and creatives, right? And we're now talking about a lot of customized assets, uh, or, you know, on different platforms and creatives and communication. Uh, Tanvi, you want to share your views on, on how, how Nivea is looking at this uh, and, you know, what are the challenges or what are the opportunities that you see, uh, you know, uh, from a consumer and targeting perspectives while creating assets? Um, uh, absolutely. I think, uh, like you said, you know, earlier uh, in a lot less complex world, uh, we were able to kind of... Uh, get a certain asset bank and then that was pretty much it that's what we would live with but i think as we move more towards uh, you know a lot of performance led uh, you know uh, thinking and a lot of performance led uh, activities uh, like puneet mentioned we do also a lot of you know cohorting uh, in terms of just understanding how our audi how our products become relevant for our audiences through different uh, sort of category entry points or need states so just Basis that you know it gets kind of multiplied into three or four for every uh, you know stage of the funnel, and that just increases complexity in terms of assets. Um, I think internally we've also been trying to figure out ways to make this entire process more efficient. So uh, we have been using and experimenting. Honestly, I would say very early stages, but experimenting a lot with. Um, AI tools to see how we can kind of build, uh, you know, uh, 
dynamically kind of create a lot, churn out a lot more assets than, uh, you know, we used to earlier, uh, feed in a certain set of messages and, you know, have the algorithm kind of optimized for it. So we've, we've kind of uh, been able to build certain tools internally where, uh, you know, once the masters are created, it, it helps us then kind of build a much larger pool. So it kind of just helps amplify that pool of assets that we generally create. Um, I think it remains to be seen how, uh, you know, how then when once that gets ingested into uh, the platforms that we typically are on, you know, how that uh, p performance uh, uh, outcome looks like. But I think we're definitely committed to kind of building a lot of automation there because it is, uh, it is a very, very labor resource intensive kind of, a, a, you know, space and, and the more we automate it, I think we can just find efficiencies out of it, yeah. Interesting. Uh, thanks for your, uh, uh, you know, thoughts, Tanvi. Uh, I, I'll point my next question to Shakti, since uh, you know uh, Tanvi spoke about uh, you know automation, and uh, you know what are your thoughts on uh, you know the different uh, opportunities today available, uh, you know, to automate uh, this asset creation. What are the kind of technologies uh, you know clients are using uh, and leveraging? And how does that kind of marry with the audience journey or the customer journey? Correct. So, uh, there are a few and uh, I'll take a minute to kind of list them down. Uh, of course, all your DSPs have their own automation of uh, creatives which are very standard and very uh, to the point. Uh, for some brands that are starting up in this journey of discovery commerce, that may uh, be well enough for that matter. Uh, it could be a display asset, it could be a video asset, it could be a text asset for that matter. It, it depends on uh, the point of communication where it is connecting with the audience. Uh, of course, there are uh, specialized uh, platforms like say a rephrase that is able to uh, do such wonderful campaigns that they've done with Cadbury Mondelez for the last three years and we are uh, in this room all aware of that, right? So that is the scale right from your most basic to uh, your most advanced where uh, uh, a celebrity is actually ensuring that you are able to discover the next shop uh, near your uh, home for that matter. And then uh, it's not just that uh, you have, once you've created that audience, you have to also ensure that it is reaching the right audience. And therefore, uh, when we look at programmatic platforms, when we look at just media platforms for that matter, they may or may not be programmatic for that matter. Uh, it is quite necessary that you understand that this is not primarily an ROI driven element and therefore the asset creation has to be looked at that way. If you, if you associate a ROI value to your asset uh, from the word go, uh, you may not be able to justify it internally and in your mind for that matter. So it is very important that when you are looking at creating an asset, you look at it from a communication point of view, from uh, an extension of your brand to your audience point of view and not necessarily an ROI point of view. So don't look at ROI is what he's saying, right? Look at it as no, an no, investment. No, no. You do. Very you critical do. for all the clients here. You do need to get ROI. Uh, but still. <laughs> Interesting, Shakti. Uh, I'll ask uh, Shorya on, you know, how do you view the investment on tech and infra? And, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, what are the pros and cons? Uh, how should brands approach this? How have you looked at it from, a, you know, Reliance perspective? Yeah, uh, I think for us, it's, uh, I mean, like for anyone else, it's it's more about uh, test and learn. Uh, but some, uh, I think the hypothesis uh, building starts from, uh, as some of the panels mentioned, that by looking at the consumer cohorts and seeing that, you know, how is their uh, sort of behavior. So, let's say the first time a merchant makes a transaction on our platform, what are the categories that they're primarily buying? And once we are moving uh, to the second and third transaction, what sort of categories that they are moving to? So how can we make sure that the category discovery first becomes easier for them? So we've, you know, created, uh, you know, widgets within the app, which makes uh, it, uh, you know, easier for the merchants to discover. So for example, if you're in a particular pin code, uh, you'll be able to see what other merchants are buying and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's termed as the trending pro uh, products in your location. So merchants can look at that, okay, uh, if the shop next to me is selling all these SKUs, maybe I should also think about, you know, selling them in my, in my shop. Uh, so, so investment from that perspective. 
and then uh, investment from the engagement perspective. So at the end of the day, every merchant is coming on our app to buy the products. What can I give them beyond that so that they, you know, they have another reason to come back to the app? So we've created uh, entertainment-led content. So for example, when cricket is happening, why uh, and how using our app they can, you know, save the time and, you know, order in, uh, in an instant and then sit back and relax and watch the match. So uh, that sort of a, uh, content is developed and the SKUs are mentioned below that. And this is from our understanding of the consumers because we also have uh, the data of the end consumers on what they typically buy, you know, during a, uh, during a match. So, uh, you know, th those sort of things make sure that the merchant's life becomes easier uh, when they are thinking of, you know, restocking as such. And uh, the third point is that we, like, you know, our, uh, 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 you know, campaigns start much before a consumer thinks of, you know, making a purchase e either for a festival or for any, uh, you know, event per se. So we have to make sure that the merchant understands that how the consumer buying pattern would change and then stocks the, you know, shop accordingly. So, you know, those, those ways we are investing in tech so that the life of the merchant is as easy as possible when it comes to ordering. Thank you. Thank you, Shorya, for your, uh, you know, inputs. Um, I would like to, you know, uh, take the discussion, uh, you know, to, uh, to something uh, different other than uh, asset investments now. A uh, very popular uh, leverage that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, advertisers and brands today are using is uh, influencer marketing, right? And uh, influencer marketing are enabling commerce in many ways. So, uh, you know, I uh, would like to hear on what are your views on integrating, uh, you know, uh, commerce and influencer marketing. Maybe we could uh, start with, uh, you know, you Tanvi on, you were telling me about some examples of how you all are leveraging influencer marketing and trying to kind of integrate, uh, you know, commerce uh, with Nivea. Yeah, um, I think uh, like most skincare brands today, we've realized the importance of influencers. It, it lends, uh, you know, a lot of authenticity, uh, you know, to the brand and to a lot of our uh, marketing efforts. So I think, uh, in terms of influencer marketing itself, we've been heavily investing behind it. It's become a big part of, you know, what we do under brand building. It's no longer just something we do on the side. It is, it is, uh, you know, contributing in a big way in building that entire uh, funnel and building the consumer uh, uh, intent. So I think uh, we've, we've been investing behind it. We've even, um, for the past three years, we've been running a program called Nivea Soft Fresh Patch. Uh, it's one of our, uh, you know, uh, ongoing uh, IPs that we run where uh, it's, it's essentially a hunt for India's, uh, you know, next freshest influencers. And what we essentially do is run a massive uh, college campaign uh, program. We, uh, we activate it through some of the social platforms to find uh, new talent. We, we shortlist uh, at least 60 influencers every year out of this program, groom them and, you know, kind of help them build uh, their, you know, online presence along with the brand. What we did, uh, you know, slightly differently this year was to also integrate an element of commerce into the center activation. So we wanted to take it a step further beyond just, uh, you know, building this, uh, you know, this, this buzz around the influencer activation. We tied up with uh, one of the larger beauty platforms uh, in, in, the, in the country and we kind of created uh, touch points within the platform itself to build more discovery for the consumer. So it is a platform that's growing on beauty and we wanted to ensure that we are there while, uh, you know, while that, that change was happening. Um, along with that, what we also integrated was in addition to a lot of the visibility that was happening on platform, uh, we, we kind of leveraged their pool of influencers as well. And through a lot of live commerce, uh, we tried to integrate, uh, we, I think we had at least four or five different live commerce, uh, you know, touch points where we could start putting out word around our product as a part of the overall influencer activation. So I think there is a lot of scope, uh, you know, to build this further. Platforms are also kind of, uh, you know, coming up with a lot more um, solutions today. They are also realizing that it's equally important for them to scale up, uh, you know, their efforts behind um, discovery commerce and, and building a lot of this, uh, you know, social commerce currency that, that we see today. 
So um, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's just a growing space which we will continue to kind of watch out for. Interesting, uh, you know, thoughts on uh, how you're kind of building the B2C uh, commerce. Uh, Shorya, what are your thoughts uh, on influencer marketing and, you know, how do B2B brands kind of uh, leverage uh, uh, this practice? Uh, I think for, uh, in our case, uh, obviously, like, in, uh, if you think of merchants, uh, influencers in most cases, uh, you know, would be a far-fetched, you know, sort of an opinion of doing the business uh, for them. So what we try to do is that we, uh, you know, try to create narratives around with, uh, you know, small town, uh, uh, I will not, small town would be a wrong word, I'm sorry, but uh, tier one, tier two town uh, theater actors and, you know, try to build a narrative of what's happening in their life and use that uh, content uh, for them to, you know, influence and, and uh, shop with us. We are also, uh, you know, rolling out, uh, you know, sort of a program where uh, once we are launching a promotional offer, how can a merchant explain uh, the same thing to the fellow merchants? So sort of leveraging their, uh, you know, uh, community sort of power instead of uh, reaching out to big influencers and asking them to, uh, you know, talk about how the merchant should purchase or when they should purchase, all those sort of things. Uh, and that, that's more uh, community focused, but uh, in, in cases when we are launching, uh, you know, a big campaign, let's say a Diwali campaign per se, even then we are, uh, you know, looking at TV actors, uh, comedians, uh, in a way so that, you know, it's more entertainment for them uh, and replicates, you know, sort of their uh, watching behavior as such because we have to uh, reach to the merchants of, you know, every small town of the country and hence, you know, building that affinity to uh, these sort of creators is important. Interesting. Shakti, what about you? Uh, your thoughts on how can, you know, brands kind of leverage influencers for uh, social and discovery commerce? So we all know in this room that influencers are pretty much the stars of social media platforms, right? And I think the democratization of uh, a mobile screen where uh, confident people got the voice to talk about themselves and talk about their life and therefore the products that we want them to endorse is, is amazing, right? While uh, promotions for this may not ne uh, really be under the context of programmatic, some platforms are programmatic compliant and some aren't, uh, it is, I mean the platforms themselves have evolved like Instagram allows you, earlier there was branded content ads, right? And today you have up to 10 accounts that can post the same content, which is basically scaling up uh, what you are talking about. And these 10 accounts could be completely different from each other and therefore reaching out to a very large set of audiences and the discovery therefore happening accordingly. So from an organic media point of view, that is definitely A+. plus. From a paid media point of view, I would say that using these assets uh, to the right audience, like I said earlier, uh, ensuring that it is reaching the right audience is very critical. And investing A, time and uh, the composite money with that time to ensure that your communication is going out and therefore people are able to uh, reach your brand or your brand is able to reach your uh, audiences. And somehow I feel that this at the same time induces a awareness and consideration funnel at the same time, right? Because A, I am getting aware of the product uh, from my influencer that I follow or the influencer that I admire uh, talking about whatever the travel, lifestyle, fashion. And I am also being encouraged to consider, I mean, they, they are not saying go and buy, there is a subtlety to how influencer marketing happens. But there is a consideration getting created, right? So that is the power I feel that very few platforms or very few mechanisms in media actually enable where uh, awareness and consideration can be induced at the same time. So that's, that's how I feel. Interesting. Puneet, what are your thoughts on how is MasterCard, uh, is MasterCard leveraging influencers uh, for social and discovery commerce? Uh, you know, what are some of the best practices uh, you feel, uh, you know, that can be kind of adopted by different brands today? Completely. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, uh, if you bucket all the hashtags on Instagram, uh, you actually would look at uh, top eight or nine buckets, right? 
which comprises almost 80 or 90 percent of the post uh, on these platforms. Now, if you look at these uh, buckets, they are what travel, fashion, health, uh, uh, nutrition, music, uh, in more or less the same buckets trending year on year. Now, the way we look at it uh, from an influencer marketing perspective is like what you know uh, Tanvi said and also what Shaurya also mentioned is uh, like you know the entire age group from 20 to 45 today is looking at uh, our, our uh, their entire uh, you know uh, consumption online is to explore truth truth in what the brand is uh, trying to say uh, authenticity in what the messaging is all about and also being part of a community which i want to be belong to a community right and the influencer marketing uh, frameworks helps to build that authenticity at the same time allows the uh, user or the consumer to belong to that community because he or she is following that influencer. Now one thing which I would like to specifically highlight is you know uh, possibly where brands can further leverage on the entire influencer marketing piece is the attributes that the influencers uh, is bringing back to the brand, right? the attributes of diversity attributes of uh, you know of the brand being sustainable being uh, climate conscious uh, you know those are those personality attributes which the influencer can bring back to the brand rather than the other way around so you know these it's 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 obviously a very exciting space so obviously we use it to our best interesting so you know we spoke about how you know social and discovery commerce is kind of uh, you know evolving at a very fast pace uh, you know we spoke about the kind of investments uh, you know brands are making on uh, asset creation we spoke about how how you know brands are investing on tech infrastructure we spoke about how influencer marketing are also kind of playing a very critical role in leveraging uh, social and discovery commerce uh, what I want to ask each of you all next is, uh, tell us about one challenge and one opportunity that you see, uh, you know, from a social and uh, discovery commerce perspective. I'll, I'll start with uh, Tanvi and if you can share your thoughts. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier as well, I think the opportunity is huge. There is, uh, uh, f again, coming, speaking for the category that we play in, whether in, you know, in terms of skincare, I think, uh, it's definitely, we've seen examples outside of India where this, this has completely boomed, uh, you know, for the category, for beauty, for personal care. So, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity, uh, you know, on social commerce uh, for us to leverage. Uh, today, we've started doing it in smaller ways like, uh, you know, through even WhatsApp. We've done a lot of WhatsApp chatbot integrations as well to bring in a lot of that direct to commerce kind of, uh, uh, you know, tie back. But uh, I think uh, we're still not in, in, in a very developed stage uh, of, of, the, of the journey. Um, I think in terms of challenges, I think for me, the biggest one today would just be measurability. Uh, I think we're facing that in, in a lot of what we do uh, in our efforts uh, through our full funnel, um, you know, marketing uh, campaign. So I think tying back to, uh, you know, if we we're talking about, you know, advertising largely on several different, uh, you know, wall gardens per se, where we talk about and just tying back, uh, you know, that, that full, uh, you know, journey in terms of, uh, you know, measurability, ROI, I think that uh, sometimes becomes a challenge. I think it's also just a part of, uh, you know, how this entire space will evolve I, as we, as it becomes a lot more sophisticated, like we've seen in other markets, I'm sure then, you know, the measurability aspect also follows suit because that does become a big, uh, you know, sort of an ask uh, when, when, brands like us are putting dollars behind uh, behind this so uh, yeah i think uh, for me that would be uh, the biggest challenge but i definitely see huge opportunity so what are some of the current kpis that you all look at from a measurability perspective when you're activating campaigns or evaluating campaigns um i think for us uh, roas would be uh, you know a big one that's definitely something we look at we also look at uh, attributes in, as a category as a brand uh, Driving penetration becomes one of our, you know, big, uh, uh, you know, you know, ta uh, tasks at hand. Um, I would say, you know, looking at attributes like new to brand, how many consumers are we bringing into uh, the brand on on these platforms? Uh, you know, how much are we? Uh, you know, what is the kind of? Uh, I would say cost to, uh, you know, the the input to output uh, measurement that we see when we look at 
what we're investing behind uh, you know these these placements so i think largely these would be uh, you know the the key kpis that we look at yeah thank you shorya what are your thoughts on on one challenge and one opportunity that you see in this area i think uh, challenge uh, uh, because i represent a platform uh, perspective would be to you know to what level can you create personalization uh, you know uh, for uh, the consumer that you are serving to and uh, does that personalization actually make sense to also drive the commerce so that's that's uh, you know a challenge and an opportunity in our case uh, that we constantly debate that uh, you know for example when we are launching a campaign if it's a pan india campaign do i customize it for uh, you know each of the uh, you know the four zones north east uh, uh, south west or should i make it uh, you know just if i serve uh, you know uh, my platform uh, serves content in eight languages should i only stick to those uh, uh, you know sort of languages uh, and we've done some uh, you know ab testing in uh, uh, over there to figure out that you know uh, if if we are uh, you know creating personalization it should just make sense to the consumer as such so storytelling uh, you know becomes a lot important that they should identify uh, with the stories that 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 uh, we are telling them and th those stories eventually uh, you know convert into a content format or you know sort of a widget or a product feature per se uh, so you know, th that's that's what we uh, face from a measurability perspective what are the kind of kpis do uh, that you all look at uh, so for every campaign there are three primary kpis that uh, you know at uh, that day what was my dao uh, what sort of uh, merchants actually converted and you know made a purchase and then how many of them were repeat customers and how many of them were new customers those are the three kpis that we look at uh, during the campaign days interesting thank you shakti what about you what are your views on one opportunity and you know one challenge that you see in this area like i said at the start of the uh, session uh, of the session that uh, we are spoiled for choice as marketers but similarly what that does from a challenge point of view is because the audience is exposed to so many platforms uh, of social media and beyond uh, it is a um, headache as far as i'm concerned to ensure what platforms we are selecting to in and reaching the right audiences right and uh, given that there are uh, certain large dsps like say a dv or a trade desk for that matter who enable a lot of uh, platforms under one roof and then there are retailer dsps like your amazon your paytms and your flipkarts that are disconnected from this but offer a very strong audience insight right because i can then uh, i mean uh, from my last experience at a cpg uh, brand i was able to identify who had purchased a hair oil uh, in the last cycle say from flipkart or from paytm for that matter and use paytm to to purchase that uh, hair oil and i am going to sell him an, a different brand or at least ensure that he discovers a different brand of hair oil that i am selling so uh there is a lot of platforms right and some of them are connected some of them are disconnected and therefore the selection becomes a big problem and because of this compartmentalized platforms your roi or your measurability may may get impacted your roi definitely gets impacted right so that i feel is a big challenge from an opportunity point of view i would say that if you are able to then sharply select a certain set of platforms limited to those platforms which have synergies within each other and you are able to limit to that what it does is limits your scale of course of audience that you can reach out but your uh, scale of money's efficiency definitely goes up right so that's a fine balance and of course this is not something that you can derive on your first campaign this is a uh, this is a discovery for you as a marketer because you will do multiple campaigns i'm not saying this is try uh, uh trial and error uh, please don't uh, misquote me i'm saying that this is something that you evolve every campaign that you do you get your learnings like uh, he was saying earlier that they have uh, uh, probabilistic analysis that they do right for what audience is going to purchase what product later that's something that you have to continuously keep doing invest in uh, analytics and measurement separately and not just do it uh, on plain i side and therefore i think that challenge will slowly start shifting to an opportunity 
interesting. Puneet, what are your views on, on one challenge and one opportunity that you see in this space? So I'll tell you what I'm excited about uh, from an opportunity perspective. One is obviously the entire mobile commerce, right? That is going to be the thing. Uh, it's like a window for shopping for almost everyone. The second piece which I'm really excited about is uh, generative AI producing uh, a lot more or scaling content. So personalized content for each uh, individuals is going to be super exciting because the machines are doing the content for you going forward. Uh, the third piece is which I, I generally feel is, uh, is, is an opportunity uh, for most brands is the, uh, uh, see there, there is a clear uh, you, know, uh, you know trend about ownership being declining, right? People want subscription based uh, services. They want products and services when they want it, where they want it rather than own it. So that I think is a very important uh, uh, trend that you know uh, brands can leverage on. Uh, I also feel the flexibility in payment and flexibility in delivery uh, is is also an opportunity for uh, brands uh, to you know uh, capitalize. Uh, from a challenge perspective, uh, while yes, there are challenge on privacy of data and uh, uh, other piece. One, uh, uh, I think you know somewhere uh, all we as marketers need to uh, sit down and figure out uh, the ethical considerations that brings along when you start building your own AI models in-house, right? You know, the biasness, uh, or like for example, like a dynamic pricing. Now suppose if dynamic pricing is built on supply and demand is still okay, but it's, if it's built on uh, a person's profile, whether if it's ethical or not is, is, is a question that we need to ask, right? So uh, uh, the, the other thing is uh, uh, how aggressive the brands need to be. Uh, there needs to be a thin line that needs to be drawn. For example, we all, there, we have all have been in a situation where we've come to a cart and decided not to buy, for whatever reasons it might be. It may be because I don't want to buy right now, I'm not sure, or this is not the cost that I was looking at. But then what the brands do is they keep on following this particular person day in, day out. So the aggressiveness of following up uh, and respecting the user intent uh, you know, these are the ethical considerations that is yeah, a challenge which I look at from a future marketing perspective. Yeah. Interesting. So you're questioning the retargeting and remarketing line item of the budget on, on plans. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your perspective, Puneet. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask Shorya, we were discussing outside on how India is kind of, you know, evolving in this journey uh, from... A, uh, from a landscape, uh, landscape perspective and uh, you know you you've also worked closely in the Southeast Asian markets uh, you know can you share some thoughts around what are the differences what are the commonalities what are the opportunities uh, you know that we will see uh, you know in the upcoming uh, uh, future uh, in, in this space sure I think uh, when I see from the audience behavior perspective I think Indian audiences uh, need a lot of uh, you know variety when they are looking at uh, sort of content. So uh, you would want to spend like one hour on a Netflix episode, but you would uh, you know also want to watch something in parallel or do a crossword or you know uh, those sort of things. So that stickiness on the content is is not there uh, so much. Whereas uh, what what I uh, saw in Southeast Asia is that people can just uh, look at people, uh, you know, eating food for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes uh, as such. Or uh, people, uh, you know, trying out different clothes or trying, trying out different games on their, on their phones. So then uh, I think in, in that case, the social commerce became more easier that, you know, we can engage with an influencer, with a gaming influencer for and create a content for like 10 minutes. Uh, uh, she starts talking about, you know, how the phone doesn't heat up uh, while she's playing Call of Duty, PUBG or so on and so forth and then talks about other features of the phone and people, you know, I would say at least we had 30% of the uh, retention, uh, you know, till uh, almost uh, uh, the end of the video, which I don't know if it will happen in, uh, you know, in the, in the Indian market. So I think that way is, uh, I would say that uh, the, the time consumption on one single piece of content is much higher in that market and that, that's why, uh, you know, uh, social commerce is, you know, a, a little more evolved uh, in that, uh, the part of the world as compared to India. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, I think we just have uh, enough time to take a few questions, if any, in the audience, or uh, I'll, I'll wrap this up. I'll, I think we have some questions here. Maybe.
Hello. Myself, Krishna Khan. I'm uh, representing K2S to Digital Solutions. This is what the question is for Puneet on the dynamic pricing. Okay. Mm -hmm. The valid point as far as the ethics and everything, but still if you see you know, airlines, they are still using these tricks. Okay, you understand that? Because I am a regular traveler, so I understand how they change the pricing depending on my needs and I have realized that, right? And even if it's because of the street vendor, okay, they tell you the price depending on your how much you're going to pay and they're the best judge, I think they're the best market, I think, in this country and the world also, street vendor, okay? And they're already practicing it and I think uh, there is a ethics, yeah, I understand the, how much ethics, but I don't think so till now there is any government restriction on that. So, so my views on the in future, yeah, there might come on policy also, if this is going in a, you know, huge scale-wise is coming on the topic, right? In that sense, what will be your view? So, so no, I, uh, let me clarify the point again. So when I said dynamic pricing, uh, if it's based on supply and demand, uh, because it's market dynamics, it's, it's based on market. But the moment dynamic pricing is based on a particular profile, that is where I said ethics might be an issue, correct? Right, I mean, yeah. depending upon, yeah. because the machine knows that this person can afford or is certain See, to buy. Uh, right yeah. now, we are working with some project, uh, I cannot really name that company, okay? They are into gaming only, okay? Uh, they have a 13, 14, uh, you know, this uh, area in different malls, right? So, and the bar also, exchange bar, talking about, right? So they are also pricing is dynamic and you know, depending on the, if, you have, if somebody has, you know, from the audience has gone there, the ch your pricing changes, right? With the, with the NFC technology and everything. We're building on similar kind of technology on some solutions which will be for the gaming also, right? The pricing will change. So I think, yeah, as I say, individual profile also, yeah, I agree on that. But that will be a question, but yeah, the still will be there in the ball game, I believe. Yes, I agree. I think that's, a, that's an evolving space and uh, incognito mode is something that all of us are familiar with and use it extensively, uh, you know, to kind of uh, battle with the machine learnings and the various algorithms that work around it. Uh, our time is up, so, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of uh, thank uh, the panelists. Uh, I had some very, very interesting uh, learnings uh, when we were discussing uh, this topic outside and, uh, you know, some very interesting uh, thoughts and point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being patient listeners.